about the terms, because it seems to me that the big industry that can be uh, started with just determined any any growth that might come in from China, say, at some point. Is there already something in the way? Well, the, the other thing about drones is that they can e be easily shot down. And so this is part of the arms race, because then once they start getting shot down, then you've got to make drones that are more uh, uh, resistant. So um, it's all part of the how you keep the, the race going. Uh, there, were, there have already been drones that have been shot down. Israel says it just shot down drones from Hezbollah. Um, the U.S. said that it shot down drones from the Iraqi government. So we had... What did you think of President Carter's announcement condemning President Obama and the irony of one Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, condemning the actions of another? Yeah, for those who don't know what he's referring to, uh, it was a fantastic um, op-ed that came out on June 12th called A Cruel and Unusual Record. And let me just read you that one part here that says, uh, despite an arbitrary rule that any man killed by drones is declared an enemy terrorist, the death of nearby innocent women and children is accepted as inevitable. We don't know how many hundreds of innocent civilians have been killed in these attacks, each one approved by the highest authorities in Washington. This would have been unthinkable in previous times. So I think it's fantastic. There, there is an argument um, by, I think, many. Could you maybe stand up so that you can? Sure. There's an argument that drones save lives. Obviously, they save lives of, of our pilots uh, mm -hmm. because they're far, far away. But that they are precise. And this is the argument. And that mostly they take out the, the intended. Um, <coughs> And, and there have been those that some of us have, have dialogued with about this. They're very intelligent and compassionate people who want to believe that. So how would you suggest that we counter that? Well, you know, we have been given this uh, a macabre kind of option that either we use drones or we use boots on the ground, other systems that are less precise. Or drop the 500 ton bombs down. Well, first I would say that um, the Pakistani government, the Yemeni government, would never allow us to go in with the 500 pound bombs. They would never allow us to go in with the boots on the ground. <coughs> the only way that we're able to go in is by drones. And drones then makes it easier for us to get involved in future conflicts and keep the militarized option on the table instead of searching for some other option. And we are not told the other option. The other option is the most obvious. And as I say in the book, there is a study done of 268 other terrorist organizations throughout the last 60 years. And how, what was their demise? The vast majority was through negotiations. They were through peace talks or they were through better policing and only 7% through military action. After now 11 years of military action, I think we can safely say that is not the answer. We need to be given other options. I also read somewhere, it takes no, we have a lot of F-16 pilot or high tech, another weapon, you know, similar to a drone in years. I mean, it's not like the drones are saving the lives of pilots. In fact, they're just taking them out of, they're taking their jobs away. And they're giving them to a less skilled person. Less skilled person. Who sees war as a game? So we had a couple of other hands up. So I guess it's too Yeah, you're aware, I presume, that you listed the, the universities, consortium, the grant, uh, the RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, is being a lot of money thanks to Congresswoman Slaughter at the Slaughter Building that they named for her, where they are developing the latest in drone technology called sustainability on the sustainability. So millions and millions of dollars are pouring into RIT for 
further because it's here in Rochester where everybody associates with the Hancock. But the other point I wanted to make was, see, this is not new. I served on a destroyer in the 1960s that carried two drones. We, they were anti-submarine helicopters, remote controlled. So we were in this drone warfare way back, actually it started in the late 50s. Uh, we could either carry two torpedoes or four depth charge. Remote controlled by the gunnery officer on the deck. And uh, we had, they were so sophisticated that in going to land one back on, it hit the water, blew up on the side of our ship, and uh, <coughs> we had two problems. Uh, so Remember, Joe Kennedy was killed uh, by one of the first attempts to have an uh, unmanned aircraft. He was supposed to jump out in yeah. a parachute, and the aircraft full of explosives was supposed to go on its own. Yeah, and unfortunately, blew up. Yeah. And, and on your first comment, uh, somebody said to me last night, well, let's not worry about drones because with global warming and, and peak oil, there's going to be no oil to have these drones be flying all around. So that's why the uh, Slaughter uh, Institute is Slaughter. on the cutting edge of how to use these drones with uh, alternative kinds of, of uh, energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. With the drones, we're not risking our own soldiers with boots on the ground, but um, I, I'm curious, what are the uh, PTSD statistics for the pilots that, you know, uh, on U.S. soil that uh, remotely pilot these? Yeah, it's a good question, and I do have a, a chapter in the, uh, in the book about that, because it's important to understand that while on one level um, these soldiers are looking at war as much more of a video game, uh, and the UN has called it a PlayStation mentality towards war, it's also putting them in an untenable situation because they're supposed to be killing people by day and then go home at night to their families and be good fathers and husbands and members of their church okay. community. Okay. So you find the same level of PTSD among drone pilots as you do of soldiers on the ground, which I suppose on one hand is kind of a good thing to show that people have a have a conscience and that we're not wired to be killers by day and not lovers by night. I promise to make an announcement. As soon as you're done with this, if you want to run over to Starry Nights, there is a singer named Rochester Fox who's singing peace songs at Starry Nights Cafe. Well, I think that might be a good one. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about, um, have you heard of the, 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 this idea that, that um, in Afghanistan, um, there like in Washington, they're moving toward this idea, like Afghan good enough, which is which says that, or it's, it's just thinking that, well, we're not really going to win the war outright in Afghanistan, so we're just going to move into this perpetual war machine over there, um, so that so that because so that because like the, the way that the balance of forces are, and like you know the they're absolutely failing to like build an Afghan army that can like defend you know defend itself because like you know we're going in there. Bonds people with drones and stuff, and like um, these, the, this, this army that we're trying to make, people are like leaving, like the members and everything. Um, and shooting our soldiers. Yeah, and so I wanted to ask about like how will um, the drone attacks, um, you know, like well, how will the drones play in that in this perpetual war machine? And I also want to comment about like go to IIT and you know like trying to talk about talk to people, you know, about how you know we gotta like end end these drones here, you know, and I think. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to change like people's consciousness like one by one. So I think what we really need to do in Rochester is really build like um, like a, we got to continue building like a great anti-war movement so that the consciousness of the students at RIT changes so that the students there also want to take the on as an issue. So as to your last point, yes, and you have fabulous people in this community to work with who can go and give talks to the students. And I think come the fall, we need to work with all of these schools and get them to try to sever their relationships with the military on this program. And the other thing is about this idea of perpetual war in Afghanistan. I mean, the, the idea that the US is going to leave in 2014 um, is a myth, unless there is a real anti-war movement that demands that the US leave. Because as the agreement is with the Karzai government, US and we'll have troops there for another 10 years. But I think it is time for us to build a real anti-war movement. 
And I'll, I'll end on my analysis of what the anti-war movement is right now, and it's pretty miserable. And that's because we had an amazing anti-war movement under the Bush administration that organized the largest demonstrations ever in the history of humankind about any issue, ever. And that was the February 15, 2003, when you know there were 40 million people in 800 cities around the world that rose up. I mean, absolutely remarkable. Um, then came Obama, and you know, it takes a long time to change policies. I know that from the Vietnam War days. We were building, we were building. And then people turned to Obama, and the movement just died. I mean, it really died. And um, I know myself from my group, Code Pink, I mean, we used to have a, a, a piece of house in Washington, D.C., where we couldn't keep enough beds for people, because they were coming in, and they were coming in, and they wanted to protest. Obama came in, we couldn't keep the house because nobody was coming anymore. And this is true of most of the places around this country. And it was a number of reasons, financial reasons, people then started working on a lot of local issues, but it was also because they were tired of, of fighting Bush years and because they wanted to believe Obama was going to really take care of the job and a lot of partisan issues. And our movement has been too tied to the Democratic Party and allowed a Democratic president to get away with what Jimmy Carter said would never have been allowed under any other administration. It's really unconscionable that we don't have a stronger movement. Because right now we have the military industrial complex that is pulling Obama to the right. We have Mitt Romney that's pulling Obama to the right. And where are we? So we really need to merge these issues, take the energy of the Occupy movement. We need young people in this movement desperately. And we need to say that any movement that's worth its salt is one that is not attached to one of the two mainstream political parties. So let's get out there and build that. So I don't have to lug them around. <laughs> Thank you.